While many people know the name Russell Simmons as one of hip-hop's greatest music moguls, in more recent years that legacy has been smeared by a series of public accusations from women who worked closely with the Queen's born and raised party promoter turned music industry manager turned executive. As one half of Def Jam Records alongside Rick Rubin, Russell Simmons would come to fame first as the manager of hip-hop's first platinum-selling superstar group, Run DMC, with Russell's brother, Run, as one of the members. Then later as a co-founder of a label that oversaw the creative work of stars such as The Beastie Boys, LL Cool J, and Public Enemy. Even after a masterful run with Def Jam, Russell Simmons would go on to explore other businesses and options through his company Rush Communications, such as the clothing brand Fat Farm and hip-hop-inclined comedy through the platform Def Comedy Jam. These days, however, Simmons' name is more associated with a series of public accusations from relatively well-known women in the hip-hop industry who claim that the mogul was a violent predator who needed to be unmasked. But unlike other powerful men in the entertainment industry, while Simmons was publicly accused of these things, he's yet to be prosecuted or suffer any legal consequences for his alleged crimes. He has, as a result, largely escaped the reckoning of the Me Too movement, while some claim that this is because he's found ways to leave and stay out of the country, but to truly understand how Russell Simmons has, at least until now, escaped the watchful eye of the law, we have to first begin with the story of his most vocal accuser, Drew Dixon. After leaving Stanford University in 1992, Drew Dixon decided to join the burgeoning hip-hop industry. Dixon finally had a professional breakthrough when she met hip-hop mogul Russell Simmons through friends. At the time, Simmons was looking for a new A&R executive at Def Jam to help him scout for talent and coordinate hit records. By 1995, Drew Dixon had become an executive at Def Jam Records at the young age of 24. Her career was at an all-time high as she was helping to oversee a chart-topping album and a single by rapper Method Man and R&B star Mary J. Blige. She remembers that in those years, Simmons was a decadent figure who most considered the living, breathing personification of hip-hop and glamour mixed up. At the time, however, most didn't know that Drew Dixon was spiraling into depression due to a secret she had long been living with. Namely, that well-known rap music mogul and co-founder of Def Jam, who served as her direct supervisor, had been aggressively coming after her. She remembers that as soon as she started working at Def Jam, Simmons' advances began, and they were relentless, allegedly. In a 2017 interview with the New York Times, 20-plus years after she first began experiencing this depression, Drew Dixon told the newspaper's interviewer that Russell Simmons would talk graphically on work calls about how she aroused him, he would regularly expose himself to her without consent, he would ask her to sit on his lap in front of other co-workers, and one evening while the two were with a group at a restaurant, Simmons pushed Dixon into a broom closet and tried to kiss her. Dixon claims that he pursued her so much at work that she eventually decided to give a copy of her office key to a male co-worker just in case she needed help or intervention. In an interview with the New York Times, she claimed that she told her male co-worker, If I ever buzz you, don't pick up, don't call me back, just open my door. That means Russell is in here, and he whipped his thing out. She remembers that fending him off eventually became a full-time job. It was exhausting. It was like making a record while swimming in rough seas. The worst of all Simmons' behavior towards Drew Dixon allegedly occurred in late 95 when he took advantage of her in his downtown Manhattan apartment. At the time, Dixon had just experienced her first major break as an executive producer, a platinum-selling soundtrack for the music documentary The Show, which featured artists Tupac and A Tribe Called Quest. Dixon claims that on the night of the incident, she'd been leaving the Bowery Bar, which was located near Simmons' apartment, but not before she walked to an ATM to get cab money to go back home. There, she ran into Simmons, who told her, You have the number one record in the country. I'll order you a car. While waiting for her ride, she unfortunately let her guard down and entered his apartment. She remembers directly rejecting Simmons' advances, but still feeling uncomfortable. I was cornered, even though there were many ways to say no. After even explaining to him that she had just had a gynecological procedure and could not engage in this activity, Simmons told her he didn't care, and that's when she remembers just blacking out into unconsciousness. She recalls, The last thing I remember was him pinning me down to kiss me on the bed. When coming back to consciousness, she says that she remembers being unclothed with Simmons in the hot tub. 
Dixon's friend Denise Gale, with whom she had been staying at the time, remembers that Dixon came back home in a daze. She told the New York Times interviewer, She pretty much told me right away that he had taken advantage of her, that she had told him no, and cried that he didn't seem to be interested in stopping. She mentally deteriorated instantly. Soon after the incident, Drew Dixon decided to quit and leave her prestigious position at Def Jam. Feeling so humiliated and broken, Dixon thought it might be wise to escape to graduate school. Instead, the success of the show soundtrack led Dixon to transfer to Arista Records in 96, where she worked under Clive Davis as an A&R executive. There, she enjoyed far more success, helping to engineer the success of singles like Whitney Houston's My Love Is Your Love, Aretha Franklin's A Rose Is Still A Rose, and Santana's Maria Maria. However, while at Arista, she still couldn't escape the terror of Russell Simmons, and it was at this time that she hired a lawyer and threatened to sue him for harassment and outstanding bills, a dispute that was later settled out of court in the amount of $30,000, which included approximately $3,000 for the expenses and the rest for legal fees. In exchange, she stayed quiet, in part because she said she didn't want to be known in the music industry as the woman who was taken advantage of by Russell Simmons. She expressed, I want to make records and be famous for that. Unfortunately for Dixon, after escaping the grip of Simmons, she also allegedly came under the terror of another well-known record executive, L.A. Reid. When Clive Davis decided to replace himself as a figurehead with L.A. Reid, Dixon argues that she began experiencing similar kinds of behavior at the hands of Reid. She recalls that when she would reject Reid's advances or decline his invitation to meet him late at night at his hotel, he would turn cold. She remembers, It was a quid pro quo. I have power. You want access. Sleep with me or I'm going to be really mean to you the next day and there will be consequences. When the New York Times approached Reed for a statement, though he decided not to address the specific claims, he did apologize to Dixon if the words he had shared with her were misinterpreted. Dixon remembers that after six years at Arista, she decided it was time to leave, even though she was very literally at the top of the game. This time, Dixon decided to leave the music industry altogether for Harvard Business School. At this point, she felt as though I could not have success in this industry unless I slept with somebody, a gatekeeper. And the fact that I would be doing it to advance my career, I would hate myself. Similar to other accusers and women in the industry, those who work for Simmons, Drew Dixon knew that despite her trouble with them, he was a needed connection in the industry. She recalled, I didn't want to cut off my one conduit to having any hope of a career. I thought if I could survive long enough to have a hit, a real bona fide hit with my name on it, I would move categories. And by category, she meant from an object to a respected colleague. Unfortunately, for her and many others, Dixon would learn that wasn't the case, if not nearly impossible to move from one category to another. She also learned that the professional price she had paid was far too steep. Not only did she in the aftermath find it difficult and taxing to listen to the music she helped create at Def Jam, but she felt like her promising career was curtailed and her ear for talent wasted. She recalled, I gave up something that I love to do. I erased myself. Now I want people to know why. In addition to Drew Dixon, Russell Simmons had other alleged victims. In a series of interviews conducted by the New York Times, there emerged evidence that at least four other women were subject to a pattern of violent behavior at the hands of Russell Simmons. In the incidents that were reported, they claimed to have occurred between 1988 to 2014. And among those incidents, three of the four additional women also claimed that Simmons took advantage of them on another level. While some might wonder why it took Simmons' alleged victims so long to come forward so many years after the initial events occurred, they maintain that the reason they came forward in the late 2010s is that they were inspired by what occurred in the aftermath of the accusations against Harvey Weinstein. Weinstein was a high-ranking executive in the entertainment industry who had served as a film producer and co-founded the entertainment company Miramax with his brother Bob Weinstein was accused in late 2017 by dozens of women in the industry of many heinous things and spanning a period of over 30 years. Following criminal investigations into the complaints of at least six women, Weinstein was arrested in New York and charged with many offenses in May 2018. He was later found guilty in the third degree and a criminal act in February 2020 and was sentenced to 23 years of imprisonment a month later. The investigation and proceedings were, in part, aided along by the investigative journalism of the New York Times and the New Yorker, and the scandal triggered many similar allegations against powerful men around the world, one of which ended up being the case against Russell Simmons. It also led a significant amount of women to share their own experiences in various different facets on social media under the hashtag. 
Prior to the accusations recorded in the New York Times against Russell Simmons, who had long been acknowledged as a key architect of hip-hop culture, apologized for being thoughtless and insensitive and announced he was stepping down from his companies. The reason for this announcement? A public accusation brought forward by screenwriter Jenny Lamette and daughter of director Sidney Lamette that Russell Simmons had taken advantage of her. At the time, Jenny Lamette was already the second woman to publicly accuse Simmons of S.A. In his public statement, Simmons also announced his public departure from his companies. He stated, I have rededicated myself to spiritual learning, healing, and working on behalf of the communities to which I have devoted my life. I've accepted that I can and should get dirt on my sleeves if it means witnessing the birth of a new consciousness about women. What I will not accept is responsibility for what I have not done. I have conducted my life with the message of peace and love. Although I have been candid about how I lived in books and interviews detailing my flaws, I will relentlessly fight against any untruthful character assassination that paints me as a man of violence. This wasn't the first time Simmons had apologized. In fact, Dixon recalls that years after her encounter with Simmons, he apologized to her at an industry event. She remembers that he told her, I have daughters, and I do yoga now, Drew, and I know what I did was wrong, and I'm sorry. And yet, once allegations emerged of his behavior in 2017, while Simmons has acknowledged that he did engage in inappropriate conduct with Dixon, he also insisted in his statements to the press that he did not engage in sexual activity with her. In addition, once he was publicly accused by a series of women, he told the press, I vehemently deny all these allegations. These horrific accusations have shocked me to my core and all of my relations have been consensual. I have enormous respect for the women's movement worldwide and their struggle for respect, dignity, equality, and power. In addition to Drew Dixon, a series of investigative articles indicated that three of the other women who had come forward with accusations were also pursuing careers in the music industry at the time of their essays. They also claimed that after their abusive experiences with Russell Simmons, their careers were also either disrupted, derailed. According to Tony Sally, a music journalist who initially met Russell Simmons in 1987 while on assignment for the trade magazine Black Radio Exclusive, as early as the 1980s, Simmons had a reputation as a charming playboy who argued he could help women's careers. In an interview with the New York Times, Sally explained that while the two went on a few dates and determined early on that they were not compatible as a couple, they stayed friends. Sally would later tell the press that in the fall of 88, Simmons would invite her to his Manhattan apartment for a party that he claimed he was hosting for his girlfriend. However, when Tony Sally arrived at his apartment, she discovered that it was empty. It was only she and Simmons there. He explained that he wanted to show her around and eventually led her to his bedroom. That's when things got dangerous for Sally. She told the New York Times, He pushed me onto the bed and jumped on top of me and attacked me. We were fighting. I said no. Despite fighting back and articulating that she didn't want this to happen, Sally told the interviewer that he continued. After the incident, Sally told two of her friends, Sheila Brody and Ariane Hershkowitz, along with one of her colleagues what had happened. In response to the accusation, Russell Simmons shared a statement through his lawyer, Brad D. Rose. Rose told the press that while the two had dated in the 80s, they did not engage in this activity. When asked why she didn't report the assault when it initially happened, Sally told the press that she worried about what reporting it might do to her career, which she was only just developing in those early years. She articulated, If I went to the police, I don't know how that would turn out. You have to understand I was very much in a man's game. Black women were just starting to break into the field. About a year after the incident, Tony Sally was attending a music conference in South Florida while working for Warner Brothers Records. While at the event, she ran into Russell Simmons in a hotel lobby, where he tried to lead her to a dark beach. Already scared of him, she resisted his persistent leading, and in response, he attacked her. She remembers that he began grabbing her by the hair and chasing her into the women's restroom. Thankfully, she was able to escape these attacks and get back to her room, where she barricaded the door. Despite sharing the details of this incident with other executives in the industry, they all brushed off the story. She explained that because no one helped her, she felt alone for 29 years, like nobody would listen to me. And she went on to say that even to this day, I don't feel comfortable in a room full of men. Following the alleged misconduct, Tony Sally told the press that she had contacted the Manhattan DA's office to make her accusations public. The New York Times conducted a law enforcement official to confirm that a woman, Tony Sally, did in fact contact the district attorney's office to report an incident from 88. 
The official also corroborated the fact that an entirely different woman who wished to remain anonymous had recently reported an incident from 1991. But unfortunately, because so much time had elapsed, the statute of limitations had lapsed, and that meant that the crimes could not be prosecuted. In addition to this anonymous woman, the official also verified that these women had been referred to the New York Police Department's Special Victim Squad. This meant that if additional allegations were to emerge, there would be a record of their complaints. Upon hearing these additional accusations, Simmons' lawyer stated, At no time did Mr. Simmons conduct himself inappropriately. In addition to Sally and Dixon, vocalist Tina Baker, for whom Russell Simmons served as a manager, also reported being taken advantage by him in the early 90s. At the time of their meeting, Baker believed that Simmons could elevate her career. When Simmons met Baker, she was working as a backup vocalist for Madonna and Bruce Springsteen, as well as working under the stage name of Tina B so that she could release pop and dance records. Baker recalls that one night in late 1990 or early 1991, she encountered Simmons at a nightclub. There, he invited her back to his apartment, where he told her they could discuss her career. She recalls that because she had been to his apartment many times before, she didn't think anything of going up to his apartment this time. However, this time was different. After entering the apartment, Simmons immediately began pouring the two drinks and trying to kiss her. She remembers he pinned her down and then... It all got really ugly pretty fast. Him on top of me, pushing me down, and him saying, don't fight. I did nothing. I shut my eyes and waited for it to end. After this, she went home and recalled crying all the way back to her residence. She would then go on to share what happened to her with her ex-husband, Arthur Baker, a music producer, her psychologist, Dr. Robin Goldberg, another therapist, and a former roommate. When asked about the impact that the incident had on her, she told the New York Times, I didn't sing for almost a year. The second he agreed to work with me, my budget increased, and the label paid more attention to me. But after that, I went into oblivion. After the alleged assault, Baker was still tethered to Simmons professionally. She remembers that in an entirely separate incident, when asked to come to his apartment for a business meeting, he began the meeting while still exercising. But then he immediately stopped, moved toward her, and pulled out a stain. She immediately fled. After that incident, she tried to get out of her contract with Simmons. While he was very supportive during the beginning of their working relationship, after these incidents, he wasn't willing to give her the same kind of support. After two years worth of languishing in songwriting and recording and her career going in a downturn, she remembers, I went into a deep depression. The events even took a heavy toll on her romantic relationships. I didn't engage with sex with a man for almost nine years. I went into a cocoon. Despite these details and reporting it to a number of people in her life, Simmons' lawyer told the press that he had no recollection of ever having any relations with Ms. Baker. In remembering the events of the past, Baker recalls feeling a lot of guilt over how she handled the situation. She remembers that after learning about the Weinstein scandal, she started to get very agitated and emotional, and as though she had a moral duty to tell her story. In their report on the allegations, the New York Times argued that despite the rise of the Me Too movement and the public accusations against Weinstein, in what appeared to be a national reckoning over this kind of thing, the most powerful men and companies and the popular music market had gone largely unscathed. The reason for this, reporters argued, was that this debauchery were built-in and readily accepted elements of the music industry. Especially given that, in that industry, the boundaries between work and play were especially blurry, especially during late-night events at clubs and studios, and many women have hardly any kind of power in the industry or any incentive to raise complaints regarding being treated this way by prominent and powerful male figures. In fact, many of these women who had said they were victims of this kind of activity found it incredibly difficult to get out from under powerful industry gatekeepers like Russell Simmons, who could leverage their pedigree and ability to make or break careers to silence their accusers and prevent any recourse for this behavior. When speaking to the paper's interviewer, Drew Dixon reminded them that Russell was like the king of hip-hop, and black women most especially felt powerless against him and his cohort of powerful figures in the very small world of the American hip-hop industry. They feared that because they had so little power and their place in the industry was so tenuous, their jobs might be threatened, they might be ostracized from the industry, or something far worse might happen to them. Dixon claimed that in response, few women were willing to share their stories, and the misconduct that had been committed against them as a result went unchecked for decades. In the aftermath of his time at Def Jam, Russell Simmons began rebranding his image. 
He ultimately went from a high-rolling model playboy who was known to party with the likes of Donald Trump and supermodel Naomi Campbell to the figure of Uncle Rush, who was now known as a spiritual yogi and elder statesman of hip-hop. After releasing books like Success Through Stillness and The Happy Vegan, Simmons cemented his holy image by spending his time focusing on philanthropy and political advocacy, at least that's how it appeared to the public. As the wave of essay allegations began rolling in, Russell Simmons found himself facing an upwards of 15 accusers by February of 2018. Despite publicly denying the allegations prior to, by 2018 he found himself making yet another statement to People magazine. In it, he claimed, I'm blessed to have shared extraordinary relationships, whether through work or love, with many great women, and I have enormous respect for the women's movement worldwide and their struggle for respect, dignity, equality, and power. I'm devastated by any reason I may have given to anyone to say or think of me in the ways that are currently being described. In recent weeks, some former business, creative, and romantic partners have aired grievances as claims I categorically reject. In some of these instances, financial motives and direct contradictory witness testimony have been supplied to the media, which has been completely left out of stories. In the last few days, one woman attempted to extort me for $500,000, only to recant her ridiculous claim. The current allegations sent to me by the New York Times and Los Angeles Times range from the patently untrue to the frivolous and hurtful. The presumption of innocent until proven guilty must not be replaced by guilty by accusation. He continued, I have already apologized for the instances of thoughtlessness in my consensual relations. I have separated myself from my businesses and charities in order to not become a distraction. I have rededicated myself to spiritual learning, healing, and working on behalf of the communities to which I have devoted my life. After making these statements, Simmons decided to retreat to a luxurious and well-known yoga resort famous for yoga, spiritual healing, wellness, and therapy. After visiting the resort's websites, journalists discovered that the Yoga Barn, located in Ubud, Bali, actually openly condemned misconduct. Its website states, Yoga teachers and spiritual leaders are coming together to proclaim, without any reservation or hesitation, that we do not tolerate SA, harassment, psychological manipulation, or the deliberate misuse of power. Those who stand behind this pledge offer their support to any victims of abuse and join a community of people striving to embody the ethical foundations of yoga. And yet, in documents that journalists obtained from a Jane Doe accuser in April of 2018, the woman argued that Simmons had fled to Indonesia, which has no extradition treaty, in an apparent attempt to protect himself. While Simmons would go on to claim that his reason for spending so much time in Bali was because it was one of his favorite destinations, he was on a journey to enlightenment, and he was continuing his studies in yoga. Journalists did learn that because the island is a province of Indonesia, it does not have an extradition treaty with the US, and this might very well be the reason Simmons was seeking cover there. In responses to these claims, Simmons' representative denied the claim that Simmons was avoiding prosecution and stated that, the accusation that Mr. Simmons has traveled to Bali many times over the years, but in the midst of multiple accusations last year has not yet returned, is also false. Mr. Simmons has been in and out of the United States six times in the last year and will be back for his child's graduation. His representative also revealed that Simmons plans on touching back down on U.S. soil shortly. During his time in Bali, investigative journalists also discovered that Simmons was selling off his real estate holdings in both Los Angeles and New York including his New York Financial District penthouse for a total of $9.92 million and his five-bedroom, eight-bathroom, 6,000-square-foot Spanish-style home in LA's Hollywood Hills for eight and a quarter million. In addition to his homes, journalists learned that Simmons was also closing down his 8,000-square-foot, two-story Tantri Yoga studio located in Los Angeles. In a statement to the press, Simmons' representative stated, Russell divested himself of his active U.S. business interests last year to focus on his spiritual practice and serving his community. As part of that journey, Russell has traveled to many spiritual destinations around the world, but continues to retain active family presence and residence in the U.S. By August of 2019, journalists discovered that Russell Simmons had reappeared in the United States, though. For the most part, he had kept a low profile. In one instance, as reported by Page Six, Simmons was spotted in the Hamptons having a vegan meal with friends at Brooklyn Chop House at the Capri Hotel. He was also spotted at the Angel Ball in Southampton, where he had donated a large sum of money to the Gabrielle Angel Foundation during its auction. 
By 2020, Simmons' antics would become the subject of public conversation yet again with the release of the documentary on the record. From the filmmaking team behind 2012's Oscar-nominated The Invisible War, a documentary detailed the allegations that had been brought against Simmons by more than a dozen women. More specifically, the film follows Drew Dixon in late 2017 as she makes the difficult choice to come forward with the allegations to the New York Times. Dixon, who was introduced to the film's co-directors Amy Ziering and Kirby Dick through a mutual friend 15 years after her first incident at the hands of Simmons, shared with them that her decision to go public was a difficult one. She remembers, I was very scared of going up against two incredibly powerful men. I felt like this tiny David going up against this huge Goliath. But I thought it was important to show how rigorous and difficult the process of even coming forward is. And I felt a little bit safer knowing these very credible filmmakers were considering telling my story. During the course of the film's circuit run, journalists discovered that two weeks before the premiere at the Sundance Festival, the film's executive producer, Oprah Winfrey, decided to bow out of the project. According to statements, her reason for doing so was a series of inconsistencies in Drew Dixon's story. Once Winfrey pulled out of the project, the filmmakers learned that they now had lost the film's intended distributor, Apple TV+, with which Winfrey has a multi-year content partnership. The film's co-directors, Amy Ziering and Kirby Dick, told the press that the documentary was an extremely close collaboration with Winfrey's Harpo Productions and that they had received only effusive notes from Winfrey during the filmmaking process. Winfrey later admitted to the Associated Press that once Simmons found out about the project, he attempted to pressure me to leave the project. She claimed, however, that was not the real reason she stepped away. Despite Oprah's departure, the film eventually found a home on HBO Max. Once Dixon learned the good news, she told the press, I'm so relieved because it's not been a foregone conclusion at any point in this process that the film would see the light of day. The film is so important, not just because it tells our stories, which is so critically important for healing for us personally, but hopefully it will also be empowering for other survivors of this thing, in particular, black women. In the documentary, viewers also learned that in addition to the accusers that came forward in the New York Times article in 2017, Simmons had also allegedly assaulted a member of the hip-hop community, Sure, also known as Sherry Hines, a founding member of the first all-female hip-hop group Mercedes Ladies in the 70s, claimed that Simmons had taken advantage of her in his office around 1983. She explained in the documentary that, at the time, she refused to share her story because she feared backlash from the community if she spoke out. When Hines learned that Oprah had stepped away from the project, she told the press, It was shocking because I always listened to Oprah as a high figure representing black women. I didn't understand, but I wasn't angry or upset. It was more, wow, why would she do that? Another of Simmons' alleged victims, Sale Lai Abrams, a former Def Jam assistant who accused Simmons of taking advantage of her in 1994, explained in the film that the documentary points out the patterns that Simmons established during the course of his behavior. She argued, It's not surprising that A, he has a type, and B, there's a methodology and process he repeats when he takes advantage of a woman. If you look all of us up, we look so similar. It's frightening. Dixon added, Russell Simmons is a sophisticated, practiced serial with a trap that he sets long before the attack, where he takes advantage of these women. He grooms us into trusting him, and then he lures us into a private space where he attacks. He even has a physical pin move that we've all discussed with each other, and that has been absolutely chilling to understand that Russell is really a monster. By 2021, despite all the backlash following the release of On the Record, Simmons reappeared yet again, this time at a very public event celebrating New York City Mayor Eric Adams' announcement that the city would be providing the Universal Hip Hop Museum with a multi-million dollar funding investment. After standing alongside the mayor during the press conference, Simmons took to Instagram where he posted, Still inspired by at New York City Mayor and the city's 20 million investment in at a museum. Thank you to the architect and founder at Rocky Bucano for his vision, hard work, and dedication to knocking down walls and seeing this project through. But not everyone was happy about his appearance. For example, activist Rosa Clemente reposted a picture of Mayor Adams and Simmons laughing it up at the press conference and alongside the image she posted, Russell Simmons has been accused of essay by multiple women, including Dear Drew Dixon, who was brave enough to not just center her story, but shine a light for other women. It is shameful, disgraceful, and infuriating to see you all, men in positions of quote-unquote leadership, consorting and laughing with him. 
Hip-hop would be nothing without the black and brown women who have been the caretakers of a culture that has been harmful to us from its inception. Question 2. The following. You are standing next to a man who has essayed multiple women. It seems like you're okay with this. What kind of men would knowingly stand next to and laugh with an accused essayer? You should be ashamed of yourselves. Hip-hop author and feminist Joan Morgan also chimed in the comment section with, The absolute toxicity of this and the message it sends to the survivors. Disgust. In September 2022, the media personality and podcaster DJ Academics made a series of strong remarks about the pioneers of hip-hop, where, in passing, he labeled them broke and dusty, or some of them broke and dusty. Upon the statements going viral, a series of hip-hop pioneers responded, including Russell Simmons. In his statement, Simmons recorded himself from Bali in a seated yoga position. In addition to admitting that he didn't have any idea who DJ Academics was, he gave flowers to hip-hop's founding fathers for paving the way, and also stated, There are people that played the parties that Rush Productions promoted, so they are the founding fathers, and they created hip-hop. Other people have become extremely rich. I remember working with artists who were the biggest of the big, and some of them aren't so wealthy today. I look at hip-hop as a way to empower others. When you get older, maybe, if you get older, Mr. DJ, you also look at hip-hop that way because, in the end, life only gives you a comfortable seat. Upon hearing Simmons' response, academics aggressively tweeted, Russell Simmons is packed up. Now the rest of you hypocrites, let's talk. What time is it in Bali? I got a few people who want to talk to Russell Simmons. Wake his ass up. You had time to address Big Ag. Address this other stuff too, King. The tweet, which alluded to the allegations of the misconduct against Simmons, reignited the public conversation over the many accusations that were brought forth towards Simmons by his nearly 20 accusers. Since this incident, the man who reinvented himself as Uncle Rush has continued to post social media content of himself in Bali, celebrating the principles of yoga, meditation, karmic work, and a bunch of other things. While it remains to be seen whether he will remain in Bali, what has been crystal clear thus far is that, despite the accusations that have been launched against him, Russell Simmons has not yet suffered the same fate as other powerful men in the entertainment industry who got caught up in the Me Too response to SA. However, we have to make it clear that Russell Simmons had come back to the United States many times within this period, and there have never been any actual investigations or criminal charges brought forth against him. So the accusation that he's just staying out in Bali to avoid charges because there is an extradition doesn't really hold up because if there were charges out, criminal charges out, and he had come to the United States, he would have been arrested on arrival. Also, while Russell Simmons did get a bunch of accusations after Harvey Weinstein and liquidated and fled to Indonesia, which does have no extradition law to the US, he did stay there and wouldn't come back until the opportune moment of the BLM George Floyd thing was going on and would actually join in political discourse about racial injustices. And his accusations were largely forgotten. He was even on TV news stations talking about the events and the protests and the riots and all the other things that were going on. And all of this was pretty much swept under the rug until his back and forth with academics who brought it up again. And Russell Simmons pretty much swerved it and apologized to academics and continued doing what he's been doing. So this is largely an unsolved story. And while it is a smear, we don't have any charges against Russell Simmons as of yet. Make sure to subscribe for more.